Car culture is an international love affair, with the nimble, high-revving tuner cars of Japan, stunning, sleek Italian supercars, big displacement American muscle cars, and many, many more. But not too many people think of 1970s Yugoslavia. There were definitely some neat little cars, but they weren't exactly quick. Most people here had never seen a fast car, let alone a Porsche. However, that changed in the late summer of 1979, when a stolen ghost white 911 would perform night after night, dancing around the entire police force. Each night, more people came out with popcorn in hand to see the show, while the police became more desperate to stop this act of rebellion. Then, the car would once again disappear, a phantom in the night. As this cycle continued, it evolved into something much greater, before reaching its dramatic climax. This story sounds like a Hollywood film, and created ripples that went on to change the course of history. This is the story of the Belgrade Phantom. So, how did a Porsche 911 end up in Belgrade? The car was owned by the tennis player, Ivko Plechevich. There's a rumor that Ivko won the car in a tournament. And while Porsche did start hosting the Porsche Tennis Grand Prix in 1978 and does give out cars to winners, the tournament is primarily a women's singles event, with 15-year-old Tracy Austin winning in 78. She also won again the next year, and the year after, and then again, until she had a new Porsche for each member of her family. So while the white Targa was Evco's, it rolled out of the factory long after he'd retired from competition. He was now a coach, but back in his day, the players barely made anything, even at Wimbledon, so he was forced to smuggle to survive. Maybe this is why he didn't seem too upset when karma came around and his Porsche was stolen. The thief was Vlada Vasilovich, although no one knew it at the time. His friends called him Vasa Opal for his love of opals, or Vasa Kluch, or Key, as he was essentially a human key which could start any car. Vasa was unusual though, and didn't steal cars for the money. Instead, there were reports that he'd take a car for a joyride before returning it unscathed with a tank full of gas. However, he didn't return Evko's 911. Evko went to the police to report the stolen car, but it wouldn't take much investigative effort to figure out where it was. Unlike car thefts nowadays, where your car is likely to be shipped halfway across the globe, the Porsche was spotted right in the center of town, doing laps around the Slavia Square roundabout. This roundabout was ideal, as it allowed for spectators to gather, but also offered eight different exits for Vasa to take before continuing on his joyride. The first night this happened, neither the police nor passersby thought much about it. But then it happened the next night, and then the night after that. Within the police, other units started to make fun of the officers on the case for their inability to catch just one man. Spectators began catching on too, and waiting around Slavia Square and other hotspots to see the Porsche. Then, things really escalated when a local radio station got a phone call from the Phantom himself. He told the radio hosts exactly when and where he was going to make his next appearance, and asked that they share this information with all of their listeners and the police. This made it clear that Vasa wanted more than just a peaceful joyride, although people still debate exactly why he took the high-risk runs each night. Some people say that he had a lover named Vesna, and that he dedicated his shows to her as a display of affection. Others say that he really did just enjoy driving around town and the thrill of the hunt. And some viewed his actions as a form of rebellion against the socialist regime. Whether it was a coincidence or not, President Josip Broz, better known as Tito, was out of the country. Tito is considered one of the toughest leaders of all time, with a crazy backstory. Apparently, he avoided more than 20 assassination attempts, and eventually wrote a famous message which was found in Stalin's office, warning him to stop sending assassins, and that if he didn't, he'd send one of his own, and that he wouldn't have to send a second. At this time though, Tito was in Havana, Cuba, for a summit of the non-aligned movement. Here he received an award from Fidel Castro himself, just one of the 119 accolades he amassed in his career. The rumor is that the news of the Porsche eventually reached Tito, who made it very clear that he wanted the situation dealt with by the time he returned. Regardless of Vasa's intentions, things were heating up in Belgrade. He continued to call into the radio station each day and announce his plans. The police were beginning to feel the pressure, 
and soon recruited the entire force to help lay traps throughout the city, even pulling the homicide division off of their cases. Still, the Portia and Vasa's love of handbrake turns were too much for the police in their cars, which were primarily Zastava's. Zastava was founded in 1853 as a cannon foundry, and has changed through the years, making firearms and vehicles for other manufacturers, before striking a deal with Fiat to sell their own cars. The most popular police car at the time was the Zastava 750, nicknamed the Ficha. Unfortunately for the police, the Ficha only had 25 horsepower, and a 0-60 to 60 of around 52 seconds. There were some quicker cars though, like the Zastava 101, with 56 horsepower, and the Zastava 1300, with a whopping 60 horses. But still, it wasn't enough to keep up with the Porsche 911, which had nearly triple the power. To help the cause, the police called in the big guns, an investigator named Dushan Zivkovich, better known as Fangio. He wasn't driving another measly Zastava though. Instead, he was armed with a secret weapon, a Mark II Ford Granada. The Ford was almost as powerful as the Porsche, but Fangio still couldn't keep up, especially with the Phantom behind the wheel. While many of the officers involved secretly admired the Phantom and rooted for him, Fangio was out for blood and couldn't stand being humiliated night after night. Seeing his prey slow down and wait for him to catch up infuriated Fangio even more. He was getting close to his boiling point. Back at Slavia Square and the other hot spots, the crowds were now huge, with as many as 10,000 people lining the roads. They brought popcorn, binoculars, and cameras to try to catch a photo of the elusive car. But some went even further, and competed to see who could get a photo of the Phantom himself. Ilya Bogdanovich took this competition to another level. He worked as a flight attendant at the time, but photography was his real passion, so he went all out, even hiring a Yugoslavian motorcycle champion to help him catch the perfect photo. Ilya had also just received new ultra-sensitive film from New York, which was exactly what was needed to take a picture inside of the car at night. Then the Phantom appeared. Ilya raced back to his studio. He was fairly certain he'd gotten the shot, but was nervous to develop the photo. As it emerged from the bath, he saw him. He had successfully captured the only photo ever taken of the Phantom himself. Now that Ilya had achieved his goal, he had to decide what to do with the burden of responsibility. If the police saw the photo, it wouldn't be long before people found out it was Vasa, and that the show would come to an end. So, Ilya decided he didn't want the responsibility, and kept the prized photograph for himself. Without the picture, the police were unable to find Vasa or the Porsche in the day, and unable to catch the duo in the nights. Frustration was building, and soon, Tito would be returning from his trip. The police were a pillar of the socialist regime, an absolute power and one that had never been challenged like this before. With both the radio and now the papers following the Phantom's every move, the situation had escalated from beyond a car theft, and some officers and officials felt that they should be escalating their methods as well. It was now the 10th night that the Phantom was scheduled to perform. The streets were lined with citizens, eager to cheer him on, but something was different. As the Porsche came in to Slavia Square, the roundabout was slick as street cleaners had just washed the road. This hampered the car's handling and braking ability, and made it unable to avoid the trap set by the police. The car slammed on the brakes, but it was too late, and the Targa rammed into a bus. The Phantom Porsche was totaled. This isn't the end of the story though, as Vasa managed to jump from the car into the crowd of spectators. The thousands of supporters enveloped him, aiding his escape while blocking any officers who tried to chase. Once again, the Phantom had disappeared. Ilya rushed to the car with his camera, and swears that he saw bullet holes in the window, but that a man smashed it with a fire extinguisher before he could capture the evidence. It was a sad night for the citizens of Belgrade. A woman emerged from the crowd and kissed the destroyed Porsche, leaving a lipstick mark on the white bodywork. While the police had finally put an end to the show, letting the Phantom escape was unacceptable and they did everything in their power to find him. There weren't many car thieves in the city, especially of that caliber, so they began arresting them all. Like Vasa, many of these men also had nicknames, like Mosquito, Merc, and Crowbar. 
The police continued to apply pressure and raise the stakes until finally someone told them it was Vasa. They showed up at his house and arrested him. While being questioned for his actions, both the police and psychologists were puzzled by the Phantom, who was quoted as saying, I don't know what pulls me to steal a car. I know it's punishable and that it'll have consequences, but when I'm in the car, I don't want to get out. They also found that his pulse quickened when he was shown pictures of sports cars. As a punishment for his escapades, he was sentenced to two and a half years in prison. But Vasa wasn't done yet. The details are a bit blurry, but the most common tale is that after a visit from his sister, he managed to escape prison and go on one more joyride. Then, a few days later, he turned himself back in, saying that he just wanted to make the point that the police hadn't won. After 30 days of solitary confinement as a punishment, he served the rest of his sentence without any issues. Apparently, he spent most of his time doing push-ups, while other prisoners sat on him for added weight. After serving his time, he was finally free. But unfortunately, this story doesn't have a happy ending. Just as Vasa had crashed the Porsche on the 10th day, he did another accident on the 10th day of his freedom, while riding as a passenger in a Lada. There are lots of theories as to what happened, and almost all of them suggest that the police were still angry at Vasa and wanted to finish him off before he caused any more problems. Whether they tampered with the brakes or not, the tiny Lada was sandwiched between two trucks, one of which was driven by an ex-police officer. His friend was killed, but somehow, Vasa was still alive. He was brought to the hospital, but for some reason only one doctor was assigned to treat him, and no one else was allowed to enter, not even his own family. A few days later, Vlada Vasilovich passed away, and much like the Phantom himself, his police file had disappeared. Most people who had the chance to know Vasa remembered him fondly, some claim he kickstarted a revolution. And others, well. Phantom je bio phantom. A fanja je fanja ostal. This is a story that could have easily faded into oblivion. While researching it, I asked some of my Serbian friends and co-workers if they knew of the Phantom. And while most of them did, the details they shared were all completely different. Some saying it started because he was gathering roses for his girlfriend, others claimed he drove a red 944, and another told me the story was made up altogether. Thankfully, there have been some monumental efforts to preserve this story, most recently in 2009 with Jovan Todorovic's Belgrade Phantom, a film which includes interviews from the late Yvko, who sold his crash Porsche and bought another, Ilya, the photographer, Vasa's friends, police officers, and of course, Fangio. I'm glad this incredible piece of history has been preserved, and I hope this video helps share the story further still. I know this one is a little bit different from others on the channel, but I hope you enjoy the change of pace before we get back to some really, really cool stories in the coming months. As always, I can't thank you enough for watching and supporting the channel. I'm still just floored by the support. This video idea was suggested in the comments, and I'm so glad it was. Otherwise, I never would have heard of the Belgrade Phantom. Anyways, thank you again so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the story, and that you have a great day.